this week. It's the land of the lost on three sides of the coin. That's it. The land of the lost is here. Hi, this is Wesley Ewer. Well, I am Wesley Ewer, and I played Will Marshall on Land of the Lost. And you know what? I sang the theme song. If you know it, sing along. You ready? Marshall, Will, and Holly on a routine expedition met the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, it struck their tiny raft. Plunge them down a thousand feet below to the land of the lost, to the land of the lost. And then Grumpy the dinosaur goes, roar. And when I look all around, I can't believe the things I found. Now I need to find my way. I'm lost. I'm lost. Find me living in the land of the lost, 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 living in the land of the lost. Sid. And Marty Crow. Take care. This is Three Sides of the Coin. Talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. As usual, we're starting with two. We end with two. We've got three in the middle. This show is all over the roadmap. But this is a show for us. This week's special guest and discussion is one that all three of us wanted to do. And it has nothing to do with KISS other than they're both set in the 70s. By the way, guys, trust me on this. If you watch the first five minutes, you'll be hooked. Our guest was awesome. You'll dig this. Yes, yes. If you were a kid growing up in the 70s, or, 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 or are interested what in what it was like yeah. growing up in the 70s. This week, we are joined by Wesley Yore, who played, are you ready for this? Will Marshall on the Land of the Lost. This is heavy shit for us, okay? We grew up every Saturday morning with a bowl of cereal watching Wesley on the land of the lost. This is so cool. We kind of all fanboy out here, but trust me when I say Wesley, Mike, what a personality. (laughs) He is so great. Such a, so much minutia that he reveals about land of the lost and Sid and Marty Croft episodes. So watch this. It was fun. I guarantee you will enjoy it. Love the show. Visit threesidesofthecoin.com. Subscribe on YouTube. Follow and rate us on Spotify. Subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. We appreciate your support. Three Sides of the Coin. I'm just going to be straight up here and go, we're doing this guest interview because we can want to. This is a cool guest. And I don't know, maybe, maybe your T-shirt, Wesley, is going to give this away. You think? Slee stacks, man. They scared the shit out of me as a kid. I know. Look at this. Uh, so we're joined by Wesley Yore. And Wesley played in the original Land of the Lost. The original. You know, I'm glad to see it did that remake. But right. I'm sorry. Nothing, nothing compares to the original. Well, nothing. You- the, the thing is, it was written by the Star Trek writers, the original. Yeah. Da- David Gerald was our head writer. If you're, tr- I, I'm a Trekkie. I love Star Trek. And so David wrote Trouble with Tribbles. He created the Tribbles. Uh, Walter Ooh. Koenig. Yep. He played Chekhov. He created Enoch, the talking slee stack, the orange one. We had DC Fontana, Larry Niven, Spinrad, all these amazing writers that were at the beginning of their sci fi careers. And they all became uh, Star Trek writers or had, had been Star Trek writers. And so that's why the scripts still hold up. They're great sci-fi. I mean, the effects are 70, so there's no CGI. Oh, 100%. 100%. So, and, yeah. and, 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 I, and I think what, what comes across between the two versions is the original Land of the Lost was created in some sense from a serious standpoint. Yes. It wasn't deliberately created to be a, a spoof, a comedy where the remake was that it took the tongue in cheek humor and went way overboard, making it 
humorous on purpose. And again, that's at least to me as a kid growing up watching all of the Sid and Marty Croft shows. They weren't they there was they were serious. They might have been wacky in their seriousness, but yeah. they were serious. Yeah, I, I agree. Listen, you know, Land of the Lost was about a family, you know, in, in, in a very frightening situation that we'd lost our mom. It was I mean, for a Saturday morning show, it was it was pretty it was pretty dramatic. Uh, you know, but but David Gerald has said to the writers, he said, we're going to be writing a science fiction show that happens to air on Saturday morning, not a Saturday morning show. So Makes that's why, and that's why it, it still has this huge fan base. I mean, we're actually so I can't believe this. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary next year of from 1973 when it first opened up, you know, first aired. And it it continues to garner new following. I think it's going to start on Pluto and it, it's always playing someplace. And Sid and Marty just announced they're doing their own channel, uh, yeah. Cineverse. And so it's good. And there's rumblings about other things happening with it. So we'll see what happens. Did you, I mean, I, 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 I'm pretty sure I knew what the, the answer will be, but when you went into Land of the Lost, I'm sure you had no idea this was going to last 50 years. You were probably like, if I can get one, one season out of this, great. That keeps me unemployed for a year. And, and yeah. here we are 50 years later. At, at what point, Wesley, did you realize this is bigger than what it was ever intended to be? Well, I was on Days of Our Lives, which I did for about 10 years, played Mike Horton. And I, I was on Days of Our Lives when I got the job on Land of the Lost. So I ended up doing two series at once. So in, in the mornings, I would film all my scenes on Days of Our Lives because they're both NBC shows. So NBC said I could do both shows. So I'd go into Days of Our Lives in Burbank and film my 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 episodes or my, my scenes that day. And of course, the cast for three years hated me on Days of Our Lives because I'd come in, leave. And then go run over to, to Goldwyn Studios. And so in the morning, I'm crying that my girlfriend is leaving me. I'm having sexual problems. Things, you know, every, the mafia is after me. And in the afternoon, I'm going, run, Holly, run. There's a dinosaur. It's <laughs> one of the biscuits of it. it was like, <laughs> but, but I, but... I got to tell you, to answer your question, I don't think it dawned on us until maybe 15 years ago. That because what's happened is in the last couple of years, it's gone from um, classic Saturday morning show to cult classic Saturday morning. Yeah, it it flipped, it flipped, and that was recent. And it's we, you know, Kathy and I who played Holly, Kathy Coleman, and Phil Paley who played Chaka the Monkey Boy. Oh, Ganza be Sasa. Uh, <laughs> it was like, you know, we we do conventions and stuff, and it it is amazing how many young people are now coming up to our table. That are, are watching it on on YouTube or watching it on DVDs or whatever, but it's it's garnering a whole new generation. It continues, and again, it's the writers. You know, Shakespeare said the story's the thing, and it's. I mean, you were talking time doorways and matrices and doppelgangers, and you know, the show never talked down to kids. Kids had to like. It was way over everybody's head and everybody had to kind of rise to the occasion. I remember reading some of the scripts and going, well, wait, 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 wait. Okay. So Enoch is is not the sleep stack, the green sleep stack are from Enoch's future, not his past. So Enoch has to go back to the past to warn his ancestors that they're going to become the green monsters. It, I mean, the antecedents and it was amazing it was really that, that's a, that is a lot for i mean again i'll put myself back in you know in the 70s when i was watching that was a lot for a kid to absorb and comprehend i mean i i mentioned it when you first got on here my biggest takeaway was those slee stacks literally scared the crap out of me as a kid i mean really scared me yeah. You know, what happened, I think they came on, I think Marty Croft told me in the third episode, and the ratings for Land of the Lost went through the roof. It became NBC's number one show, not Saturday morning show, their number one show. Wow. Wow. It was crazy. I mean, the Croft, you know, this was the most successful Sid Marty Croft show, ran for yes. three years, the longest show. It's still, it's still on, it's still being talked about. I mean, you, you, I watch news broadcasts and they'll say, oh, he's like a sleestack or, you know, oh my God, it's Chaka, mm -hmm. you know, you hear references like 
Family Guy, Pete, uh, uh, Peter Griffin. He's auditioning for Lois, and he sings the theme song to Land of the Lost. I mean, it's referenced in, you know, from Bubble Boy with, with Jack Gyllenhaal and pretends he's me and, and sings the theme song. I sang the theme song on the show uh, originally. But uh, and it's just it's interesting how, how it becomes part of the lexicon of pop culture. It, it's somebody did on YouTube. They did a compilation of things they had found where Land of the Lost was referenced in movies and TV and songs. And it was it went on for like, I don't know, 15 minutes. It was it was pretty amazing. Well, you know. It seems like all of those Sid and Marty Croft shows have reached that different, that different status level in the last 10 to 15 years where, you know, again, back then you didn't know it was cheesy when you were a kid on Saturday morning with, with, you know, your cereal watching, watching these shows, you had no idea. And then maybe you get into the eighties and the nineties and you're looking back and, you know, everybody's like, what kind of drugs were all those people on making those shows? Because they well, were just okay. weird. So go Sid, ahead. So Sid Croft, you know, I mean, he wrote Lidsville, Hoffman stuff, Land of the Lost. So finally at Comic Con in San Diego, Sid goes, "All right, all right, I did inhale." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, you you do a show called Lidsville about a bunch of hats that at least had to come to you in a drug-induced dream. Well, from what I understand, Sigmund the Sea Monster, of course, is, is like a giant thing of seaweed. So Sid was yeah. there with a friend, and I think they probably, I would imagine they were a little high. And a big wad of seaweed, wa seaweed washed up that was a clump. And that's what became, you know... Uh, uh, Sigmund. Sigmund the Sea Monster. And I'm sure I think I think Sid said he he had a, an epiphany, and I think he raced back to the studio and was writing Sigmund the Sea Monster from his vision on the beach in this clump. I mean, could you could you imagine Wesley today these show ideas being pitched for the very first time? I think they would have been laughed out of the studios they were pitching. I agree, but you know, you look at look at Bewitched or Gilligan's Island. You know, my mother, the car, all of these, 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 these shows that, you know, Mr. Were, Ed. Yeah, exactly. Mr. Ed. Yeah, we're going to have a talking horse. Yeah, sure. Let's put that show on the air. You know, <laughs> you know, unless there's a, unless there's a wisecracking kid telling his parents off, you know, nobody's, nobody's going to produce it these days because kids shows that, you know, I created Dragon Tales on PBS. I'm one of the three creators and, you know, it, and th that was for PBS. So it had a different. A different agenda quality it was bilingual it was you know it, it, but but most of the shows for kids are now you know there's some smart alec you know whiz kid that is putting his parents down and he's kind of run, running the family and stuff like that so it's interesting how because the land of the lost kathy first is kathy's character holly she was kathy was 12 years old when it happened and she was one of the first on television the first young girls to be like a leader. She was, she saved the family. She rescued us. She, she took initiative. We do these shows and that people are, you know, they say, you were my hero. You were my, my mom, right. My role model, you know, and, and the, it was, you know, listen, it was ahead of its time and the tech and it wasn't cheesy back then because the technology was state of the art. Oh it yeah. Was, it, the first, the first week we shot, the dinosaurs, which were stop frame, were film, and we were videotaped, and we were on the green screen. It was called blue screen back then. It was a chroma key blue. And in order to, so we were on this thing, so they'd have the monsters on the, on the film screen, I'm showing it, and then they'd shrink us down to try to put us into the scene. Well, they couldn't meld the videotape and the film together. It didn't work. And they thought, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We, we don't have a show. And that week, all the Disney technicians came in, all these amazing techno people in, in Hollywood got together and they solved it and it made TV history at the time. So at the time, it was actual state of the art. I mean, it, it, it really was. It, again, you can't, look, you can't look at it through the eyes of 2023. But if you look at it through your eyes back in the 70s, that was state of the art. That was stop motion. That, to your point, that was blue screen. I mean, it was... It might look cheesy, but 
that's what the original Star Trek looked like. Exactly. You know, I, mm. I, I tell you, I find it charming instead of sleazy. I and, yeah. And I don't think I'm alone in that. They did some research when I was doing Dragon Tales, which was animated. Uh, and ours in Dragon Tales is not 3D animation like all the Disney stuff is now. It was it was you know it was flat. And they discovered that kids and all of us have a more of an emotional connection to a 2D image than the 3D image. That there was there's a, there's a separation. So so the flatter it is, like the Simpsons, which are just you know stick mm -hmm. drawings basically that come to life. We have more of a relationship to that than the real detailed, you know, animation of, of Toy Story or something like that. I mean, which is beautiful and it's extraordinary and it certainly is evolving and evolving. But but there is something with our brains that that makes us more attracted to it. I don't know if it's because it's we're used to it as kids and maybe that's because it's nostalgic. But there's something there's something there that resonates with us. The, the lower the lower quality stuff. I, I know that's weird, but it's true. Did Wesley, do you think one of the things about Land of the Lost that that kids were maybe able to connect to better than the other Sid and Marty Croft shows? Because again, I grew up up and stuff, the Bugaloos, Lidsville, all of them every Saturday morning, was that Land of the Lost had an element of this might sound weird, but actual realism to it. Oh yeah. It it it, it was it was not a bunch of puppet characters it was real people dinosaurs which as kids what kid doesn't love dinosaurs and you knew dinosaurs were real at some point in time so maybe there was more of a an ability to actually relate to it as opposed to again i you know lidsville i can always be entertained but you know you watch lidsville and you go there's just no way that's gonna ever be real but right. maybe going down a waterfall and seeing a bunch of dinosaurs could potentially be real in the mind of a you know a ten year old. Well, if Land of the Lost was a drama, I mean, we had lost our mother. Our mother was dead. In fact, one of the one of the episodes, the Sleece Deck, pretends he's our mother to bring us in to kill us. This was this was not like a oh my god we're with dinosaurs and let's go ride them and you know this is going to be fun. No, it was it was a family that was fighting to live. The sleep sack were trying to kill us with the we go into the pit and, and they try to throw us in with the the the, the, the sleep stack god and all these things were happening. It was a drama. It was a family that was stuck together in this incredible circumstance. And like the Will Ferrell movie, of course, it was just a comedy. And you know, he was just you know, I remember when and when I first saw the movie with Will, because I did a scene with Will. It got cut. Kathy and I did, you know, but uh because the end of the movie. We were part of the, an ending of a movie, the, of the original version, and they cut the ending and added Matt Lauer, and they threw out all that part that we did. But I remember, you know, he when Will first sees the dinosaur, he goes, "Oh God, it's a dinosaur!" You know, it wasn't like, "Oh my God, it's a dinosaur!" It was, it wasn't fear; it was amusement in a strange way. Different point and, of view. It, exactly. So it wasn't a family drama. It, it was, a, it was Abbott Costell and Will Ferrell. Listen, he loved Land of the Lost. I mean, he was, he, in fact, he played a character, I think Spongebob, he did, it was Marshall Will and Holly was his character because, you know, it's Marshall Will and Holly. Right. <laughs> on a routine expedition, met the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, it struck their tiny rafts and plunged them down a thousand feet below. Where? To the land of the <laughs> lost. To the, to the land of the lost. And then Grumpy goes, roar. Yep. You know, but he, ah, he, I love that. he, he embraced that character as Marshall Will and Holly. And uh, so he, he, and you know, and I, when I saw him on the set, he was filming, you know, he came running over. He had just sung the theme song, which he does in the movie. And I did the original theme song. And he goes, Wesley, I just sang the theme song, you know? And it was like, he was so proud of himself and, and wanted to share that with me. So listen, his intention was great. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm not saying yeah. it wasn't great at all. It just came from a different, perspective than the original series absolutely came from. absolutely yeah and yeah what i'm curious about is, is that you know there was an awful lot of um, merchandise made from the tv show because it was so incredibly popular did you did you get and keep one of everything it, what's weird is that to this day like a couple of weeks ago there's a there's a couple of websites uh, fan based websites there's the land of the lost 1974 76 which is a huge one and fans of the lost mm -hmm. and they post 
some photos of some of the merchandise. There was something I had never seen before with my face on it from the 70s. Really? Yeah. And we didn't get any piece of that. And in fact, that's people always ask, why did your dad leave? Spencer Milligan, who played Rick Marshall, why did he leave after the second season? And again, he tried to get us some merchandising. They wouldn't give it to him. That's part of the story. And he left. And then Ron Harper came in, who worked on Planet of the Apes and became, it was our Uncle Jack. So I had to go back into the recording studio and I had to re-record a new theme song, which explained what happened with Uncle Jack. And right. did you did you at least get royalties from the song performance? No, nothing. I got nothing. Ah. Oh, please, no. <laughs> you know, listen, you know, the first year, the worst, the worst decision, I, you know, was, I was billed as Wesley. Just Wesley. <laughs> well, first of all, it was the 70s, right? And I actually, well, but but Wesley, wasn't that done because you were also on the soap opera at the same time? But so they didn't want to confuse people. I was also recording for Motown at the time. Yes, yes, Motown. Thank you so much. Mike Kerb was uh, my producer. We did a boy, it was a boy band. It didn't go anywhere, obviously. So the manager goes, oh, just Wesley, you know, that would be good. So I always tell people, because by, by the second, third season, I added the Wesley Ure, E-U-R-E to it. And they go, well, why did you do it? I go, well, because the costs were so cheap. They wouldn't spend the money for the extra four letters, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I told Marty this too, by the way. He just, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> well, and I'm sure it's got to be hard to be in your position because you're on this incredible TV show, but it's no different than professional athletes. You know, back in the 70s, we'd go see the Vikings play and and those guys had regular jobs during the year. It wasn't a full time occupation for them. And so much has changed over the years with residuals and, and you know, merchandising and all that, that now you know what you know. So these actors have agents that are trying to cut those types of deals. Right. Well, it, even when, when we started Land of the Lost, it wasn't even union back then. There was no union like Screen really? Guild or AFTRA. There was no union for Saturday morning. The third season, the union kicked in. But speaking of athletes, is Bill Lambeer of the Detroit Pistons. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah. I was going to. You, you know this. Yeah. yeah. So Bill, you know, was a sleaze deck. He was in college ball and they, they hired these huge guys. So Bill's seven feet tall and uh, he was one of the sleaze decks and he earned extra money for college. And in fact, Kathy and I went and surprised him. He was he was he was coaching the Aces, which is the women's basketball team in Las Vegas a few years ago. And Kathy and I do the Star Trek convention every year. And we're the only show that Star Trek lets in other than Star Trek because of our, our monsters were created, created by Mike Westmore, who did all the Star Trek monsters. Our writers were all Star Trek. So we go into surprise bill and it's been arranged by the head of the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, um, um, the basket, the, 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 the WNBA. Thank you. Yeah. They, they arranged it. But all the women in, in his team knew we were coming. And they had eight by tens of sleeve stack they'd hidden from him. And we walk in and they all put up this picture of a sleeve stack in front of their face. And he's looking at, he's like, because, you know, he had quite a reputation if you're, if you're a fan of the Detroit Pistons. <laughs> but he finally realized who we were. And he was like, Arr. we gave him gifts. We had <laughs> NBC, then we were doing like a photo ops and stuff. And finally he goes, I have to go coach. So he left. And the head of, of the league came up to us and said, listen, I've known Len Beer since he played college ball. And I got to tell you, I have never seen him smile this much. So it was a nice reunion. You know, he That's was great. Well, was, was that like the first reunion you guys had had since yeah, filming? I hadn't seen him since, you know, I, you know, he went on and became become this famous guy. And it was it was interesting. And, they, and he, he didn't talk about it a lot, but it started to come out later in his career that he was a sleaze stack. Interesting. What are the now, um, what are the uh, Star Trek conventions like? Well, I, well, I'm a Trekkie, so I love it. Okay. And it's we do it at the Rio Hotel in Vegas every year. In fact, Kathy and oh. I are doing it again. Yeah. It's the, like the first week of August. It's about a six day show. It's so it's the days. same same place every year in Vegas yes. in early August. Yeah. And, and and we sit there and they won't even tell, they won't even advertise that we're there because we're not Star Trek. 
But so from people, they walk in and go, what, what are you doing here? And then we, we explain that it was, you know, we have banners that say our writers were Star Trek, our, our monsters were Mike Westmore and stuff like that. But we have so much fun. We call it our summer camp. We just go and we sit and laugh and, and, and have some fun with fans and things like that. Well, Wes- Wesley, let, let me dig into these conventions you make because you, you do a lot of them. And that's how you and I first met was last year when you attended the first annual CroftCon convention up here in the Bay Area. As, as KISS fans, and I don't, you may or may not be aware of this, KISS has many official and unofficial conventions all the time around the world. Right. You know, and it's, you could liken it to a Star Trek convention. It's just totally. a bunch of KISS, KISS geeks, not Star Trek geeks, but it's the same concept. People selling stuff special guests, you name it, all that stuff, photo opportunities, and you name it. But what I wanted to kind of give you credit for is when you and Kathy do these convention appearances, you really go above and beyond what almost every other guest at any convention does. And what I mean by that is if you go to most conventions, most of them are sitting behind a six by six table whatever with a banner behind them and a bunch of eight by ten photos and you just walk up and it's like hey shake hands sign the autograph and that's it you and kathy theme out your entire appearance together meaning you bring a yellow rubber raft you bring a dinosaur head sometimes you've got elaborate backdrops behind you and you do And it's not just a selfie of standing behind a table. You both will get into this rubber raft, put life jackets on with you and the fans and take a photo. And I'm just, I'm just so impressed by how much you guys do to go above and beyond just a normal convention appearance that 90% of the other celebrities out there do. Well, we, Kathy and I, it was Kathy's idea to, to, to bring this yellow raft. And believe me, it's like a circus coming to town. <laughs> We're hauling this stuff. I mean, it's not just like coming in, like you said, a little suitcase with a couple of eight by tens and a pin. You know, we've got Sleestake Head. Sometimes we have trucks arrive with a pylon. We have fans that have built pylons. We have one, our friend Howard White, who, had, who bought a Sinclair dinosaur from the, the gas stations, you know, yep. the green ones. Well, he painted it. Uh, to look like dopey you so you can ride it he he'll haul that in his truck but it's the yellow raft with and with the oars and we put all the fans in with us and the sleeve tech heads but we scream going up like yeah a, going over the waterfall and we've had every every celebrity you can imagine at crofton actually uh christopher knight from brady bucks right he and his wife with their with their dog got into it and his wife comes running up to me after we shot the photo. She goes, Leslie, Leslie, look at this, look at this. This is going to be our Christmas card. Nice. <laughs> well, we from, from John Schneider to Lonnie Anderson to Don Wells, bless her heart. And um, I, 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 the, the Little House on the Prairie. The, I mean, every all these casts, Mindy Cohen, every, celebrities, when we do these shows, we're noisy. We're going, ah, screaming and singing the theme song because we thought, listen, we're all in this together. It's a lot of money to sign, you know, that you're paying for autographs and we don't take it for granted at all. So we said, let's create an experience, you know, an autograph's an autograph, but, but this is a moment in time that we can create. And so we, we costume everybody, we put them in the raft. I direct it because I want to make sure the yellow oars are a certain way and everybody's head's cleared and how where the hands go and not blocking anybody. And we, I say, now remember, we're terrified. <laughs> and yeah. we all go over. And the photos, if you go to my, go to Facebook or Wesley, you are, uh, you'll see a lot of the photos and they're hysterical. Uh, and, and so sometimes like we'll be doing a show and celebrities will be sitting around us. And of course, they're just sitting at the table saying, oh, yes. and they're yeah. like, all right, let's just scream. And, I don't do and by the second day, they're going, can we get in the raft? <laughs> well, it's had, contagious, I bet. You know, the, the, well, yeah, the, and why the, not? That's a great yeah. idea. I remember Patrick Wayne, John Wayne's son. Yeah. He didn't want to get in the raft. His agent finally made him get in the raft. 
He comes by the next goes, listen, can I do another rap picture? I go, why? He says, I put it on Facebook. He says, it's blown up. Everybody's loving this picture. I need to do another one. Yeah. Uh, you know, because you have to understand, we're also fans. You know, we get to, Kathy and I, and Phil Paley, who plays Chaka, does some of the shows with us. But we get to meet our heroes. I mean, I'll be sitting next to Lou Ferrigno or, or, or you know, um, gosh, Gil Gerard. I mean, and spend the weekend with these guys, you know, and, and and so we get to fanboy out too. But we decided, again, we decided that we wanted to create something that was memorable, that was, that connected us to, to our show. And that was a, a lot more than just a, a standing next to somebody with a finger going, hey. Like, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, who wants, I mean, that after a while, who cares? You know, that photo you'll you'll put up for once and it'll go away. But the land of the lost photos have made their way around and people will Photoshop them onto a, they'll cut out the backgrounds, put themselves on a waterfall. And it's pretty amazing. I got, yeah, I, I got a kind of a weird question. Sure. Because I, I you know, I, I just know you from land of the lost and uh, much like Michael and Tommy, you know, because I'm 58. I was a huge fan of that was, you know, you guys were the target audience or I was a target audience for your show. But I just got a kind of a weird question. This kind of ties in with with Kiss a little bit because I just have a per it's not, not so much a personal question, but when you said you were in a soap opera before Land of the Law, or right when you were doing that. While he was doing it. Yes, correct. So did you were you featured in like the 16 and the team beat and all that kind of stuff before that or or right when land of the lost took off then you were in the pages of that sort of stuff and and what does that do to a to a you know a young man i i'm just curious about what that's like all of a sudden seeing yourself in teen magazines what he wants to know is where the chicks all over you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, 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 but I mean that that's got oh, you're, you're right. It's, it's all of a sudden you're like, you're, you know, you're just going to buy your nut and honey and milk at the 7-Eleven. You look over and there's 16 magazines. And you're like, Wesley, you're right. And you're like, oh, win a date yeah. with Wesley. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's what's that like? That's it was just, it was trippy. It started when I was on because I was on Days of Our Lives a short period before I got Land of the Lost, and then after yes, Land of the Lost, so were, did you get any attention through the teen magazines through then, or or was it right when Land of the Lost hit? It, it was just starting on the teen magazines. I was soap opera digest all the soap at magazines. I was on the cover, and but then I got Land of the Lost really within months of, of getting on Days of Our Lives, and then when Land of the Lost was over in three years, I continued for about seven years on Days of Our Lives. So I continued on the soap opera, um, but it was weird because I, listen, I'm from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. My family's not in show business. I announced at the age of five, I said, I'm going to be an actor. And my family were all educators. You know, there's a president of a college, my, my grandmother and my mother from the South in Mississippi, they were teachers and educators. And, you know, this was like, yeah, they were going like, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, so I didn't think of myself in those terms of being, the truth is, I didn't think it that attractive. I mean, I just, I, I just, it wasn't something that was in, I thought I'd be a stage actor. I'd just come from New York. I had worked at the American Shakespeare Festival at Stratford. As a, I got my first job with playing Ariel in The Tempest. I had my first nightclub act when I was 19 in Provincetown singing comedy songs. And suddenly I'm I, I on TV and it was like, it was weird. It, it was it you know I would you're right I'd go to this I'd go to the store and there'd be I'd be on the cover of Sixteen magazine or soap opera digest or whatever and um, it didn't seem real and it it just didn't seem real but I do win a win the win a date with Wesley and all that they were there they were there I did those things but and back then the teen idols it was a smaller group of people like the, the I knew everybody. Because we'd go to the well, same party. That was they that was what I was actually like. I was kind of in a roundabout way. So who did you meet from doing those sorts of things? Oh, everyone. So so I remember, like, you know, we and Lawford Publications did did uh, one of the, the magazines, but but David Cassidy. I remember Sean Cassidy and Leif Garrett. I, I rented. I I didn't have any money when I I suddenly got two series immediately. 
but I had to go buy a car and rent a house. And because I was at a house in Hollywood and I got a call one day and a guy go, you Wesley, you're, and I go, yeah, yeah. He goes, I will, my girlfriend loves you. She watches you on TV. I go, oh, oh well, thank you. He says, I'm going to kill you, man. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I, I, my phone, I, it was it was the 70s. I was not, I, I, I hung up that phone and I had to get, I had to find another place to live. I was terrified. So I read a place, but I remember like, like Sean, before he even had a t- TV show with David was the big star, come swimming at my house with Leif. You know, I just did a thing with Greg Evergon from BJ and the Bear. Greg, before he was famous, came and he was hanging out at the house and said, look, I'll, you teach me to act. I'll teach you to sing. You know, Sam Jones uh, used to hang. I had a horse ranch. I got a little horse ranch. And Sam would come out this before he had anything. Didn't do uh, and wasn't Flash Gordon yet. But, you know, Gary Sandy from uh, WKRP would hang out, and bring his girl you know, and spend the weekend at my place. But it was, so we all knew each other. I mean, a lot of us. And it was kind of like a little fraternity. And it was kind of, it was kind of wonderful back then. You know, Michael Jackson, you know, going with the BG kids to Disneyland. I mean, it was like, you know, it was fabulous. But, but I, I, I didn't see myself in that light. And I would do concerts. I did a lot of concerts. I used to, uh, used to headline in Vegas. I used to open for <laughs> Bill Cosby. And uh, that's another story, but um, <laughs> you know, and I, I would do telethons every well, on the winter weekends when when we did telethons back in the day for the March of Dimes. I was their number one fundraiser back in, the, and I remember going to uh, Pittsburgh, and it was like it was like the Beatles with the car being pushed over, the girls and the fire department had to come and they they had to get me out of the hotel to the airport. I had to disguised myself as a firefighter with the helmet and the whole thing. I got some, one of the firefighters costume, I mean, uh, uh, uniforms. And I, the, in a huddle, I walked out and the girls were all in the, in the hallway. It was trippy. It was very, very trippy. What's the weirdest piece of fan mail you got? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh my God. Other than the foot fetish, but that's a whole nother story. Uh, <laughs> Tommy, Tommy, did you write that one? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Busted. On Days of Our Lives, I was I, I was I was pretty popular I went on Days of Our Lives. I played Mike Horton. And I had the biggest fan mail box at NBC for this. And um, I got this. I started getting this handwritten letters from this lady, you know, love your performance and stuff. Well, the letters kept going through the year, it got more frequent. And suddenly there were five days a week, five to 10 handwritten pages to me. And the last one was Dear Mike, because I played Mike Horton. My trailer is you drive down this road because we're getting married on Saturday. And she sent a picture of her kids, naked little kids in the bathtub. And she said, we're getting married this Saturday. So you just drive down here, you turn right, you turn left, you do all this thing. And it was like this huge handwritten thing. Now, when she said we're getting married, does she meant you and her? Yes. <laughs> my carrots. She saw me as Mike Horton. Yeah. Right. So I, that's the one time I took that. I, I went to the, <clears throat> the executive producers of Days of Our Lives and said, you got to handle this. This is scary. It, t- it took a turn. And that was you the thing. God, I'm almost be- feel bad. I asked the question. I didn't see that <laughs> fucking comment. Oh, oh. And well, you know, and I got to say, you know, with, with email and the internet and Facebook, I mean, it's easy to reach out to a celebrity these days and say what you want to say. And it, it can be a little squirrely. And, and I've had some, I've had some, you know, with the new technology, certainly I have had my share of uh, creepy, you know, inquiries. And stuff like that. What Wesley? Let's let's go back to last year for the CroftCon event. That was the first. That was the first event that was all focused on Croft oh. and all the Croft stars and shows. What was it like for you to reconnect with Sid and Marty and and all the other actors and actresses from the other shows? I mean. What what was that like all these years later to sit there and go, wow, there's that show and that show and that show and that show. And because, you know, from a fan standpoint, 
it was an incredible experience. And I got to imagine for you being part of that inner circle, I mean, you guys don't hang out all the time. You and Kathy, yes. But the rest of that Sid and Marty Croft world, I got to imagine you're not, you're not connecting with them that often, if at all. The good news is we do stay in touch. Um, that our past, because we do these autographs, so like Johnny Whitaker, you know, from Sick of the Sea Monster, or Butch Patrick from the Monsters, he was in Lidsville, or Sharon Baird, who played Sa in our show, was also, a, a, she was a, she was the original Sharon in the Mouseketeers, but she also was a costume character in all the, in the Croft shows, and the people that were there, and I see, and, I, and I've seen Sid Marty off and on, I, and it was, it, first of all, it's wonderful, we all like each other, I mean, we really like each other, but Derek Zemmerich, who owns the Orinda Theater, which is where this was held, put this together. And it was the first time. And it was extraordinary. You know, I, first of all, I was so proud of Sid and Marty Croft. I mean, to be just a, like a tiny, like a little speck of their of their legacy. You know, I'm just one of the shows. And to have shared that moment with these guys was amazing. Because Sid's in his mid-90s and Marty's in his very late 80s. Uh, so, you know... You know, I don't know how many times we're going to have that kind of a gathering again, uh, but it was extraordinary and it was fun. And we again, we all like each other. And so it was there's no drama. There's no everybody. Oh, I don't want to sit next to her. or Oh, my God, I'm having a fight with this person. No, there's none of that. It's like, yay. In fact, we're, we're all we're doing another little Croft get together in uh, Philadelphia in December. And Johnny Whitaker's coming and Scott, the guy who played his, his best friend on is coming. I think Butch Patrick's going to try to come, uh, you know, it, and, and Phil Paley, Chaka is going to come and Sharon Baird is coming and some other shows from Shazam, from Shazam and different other yep. shows. But um, it is like a little, it's a fraternity. It's, it's like a private little club and, and I'm glad to be a part of it. In fact, I, I just love your attitude. I think it's great that you embrace what you've done because it seems like sometimes actors have a tendency to run from certain roles, whatever they might be, and could never quite embrace it. Like uh, Tina Louise, for instance, from Gilligan's Island. And I'm, I could never understand that because Gilligan's Island to me was one of the coolest TV shows ever. I, I don't, it's just so it's refreshing, at least from my perspective, to see how how you embrace it. I think it's great. Well, and we know a bunch of people, actors that were on shows that won't sit together, won't do a convention together. If one of them's coming up, I won't give names, but yeah, one of the actors is coming, the other one refuses to come. One person signs a, an autograph of a, of a cast photo, the other won't sign it. I mean, why? Why? I mean, to, That's to just gratitude is, is, is huge. The fact that, you know, you, to, to be an actor and, and to have a, a hit series, is really luck because anybody look William Shatner could have had a head cold that day and not walk through the audition and some other guy would have been would have you know would have been Captain Kirk yeah he happened to do it you know you just I went to a I got land of the lost because a friend of mine said hey I'm going to a Sid Cross house why don't you come on Saturday we're going to go swimming and and I walked into Sid's house I'd never met Sid before I'm a young guy and he goes, you, 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 you're perfect for my show. Here's, here's the casting director, call her on Monday. I mean, you, all those coincidences, you know, the planets line up, but not to be grateful and to celebrate what people love about what you've done is would, it, for any profession, I'm not just actors, but for any of our professions, whatever we do, not to, not to embrace our successes and our failures, but to embrace what, what has gotten us to this point is, you know, it's huge. Yesterday I had lunch with, with Joe Giamalba who played the nasty Pakuni. Kathy and I had, we had lunch with him here in Palm Springs. We had a little Land of the Lost mini reunion and just laughed and giggled and, you know. It's awesome. Yeah. So let me, let me, let me give you an observation as, as a kid, I remember when watching Land of the Lost, I always felt like, boy, you guys as a family, when the Slee Stacks were, coming after you if the slee stacks knew how to run fast <laughs> this show would have ended after the first episode but they kind of always were just like you know yes. you guys you guys as 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 the as as their their targets could easily just kind of 
fast walk away from them and you would be leaving them in the dust. I felt that was always funny as a kid. It's like these lease stacks, they scare the crap out of me. But boy, they're stupid. They can't catch these guys. <laughs> well, you have to remember, first of all, it was 1970s, right? And there was a ch- standards and practices for kids that they couldn't hurt us. You know, things have changed a lot. You could you blow kids up and curse and swear. And <laughs> you blow up. kids up today on TV. Yeah, yeah. It's like all that, but it's like so. So there was there was a fine line that we could cross. You and in fact, I, I remember we, Kathy and I were doing one scene where we with Silly Stack was pretending it was our mother, and we were sobbing and looking into the the mist. And this it was our mother, Brooke Bundy, who was playing the character, and we looked at who was also on Days of Our Lives with me at the same time. So we were, you know, and, and we, we did this and the director comes running out. I think it was Bob Lally. And he said, listen, guys, that was too real. He said, you got to pull it back. This is Saturday morning because Kathy and I and Spencer and we all played it for real. We, you know, we didn't play this like, hey, we're, you know, we're the land of the lost. We played, we, we, this was a drama to us. And I think that's one of the reasons it was successful. First of all, we all liked each other a lot. Spencer still. Which helps. Yeah, Spencer, I'll call him on Father's Day or he'll call me and go, he'll go, hello, Wesley. This is your papa speaking. And, you know, and I go, Papa, can you hear me? And, but we, you know, we, we like each other. And I think that that resonated and showed through. Yeah, it, 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 and it, it makes it even more important when you share how there are other actors from different series and stuff that, one will sign, one won't. They won't do them together. And that's just, how, how can you have 20, 30 years go by and still have that much bitter feeling towards someone that you acted on a show with? I, I, I understand about personal relationships and stuff, but some of that just seems so weird to me. It's so sad to me. I, I, there's a couple of really major cases that we deal with fairly often because we do we recite yeah. like conventions, and I, I I don't get it. And I've asked each of them independently, go, what happened? What could be so bad? And they really can't verbalize it, and that's the sad part. I mean, we're talking stuff you know is like you said decades ago. Yeah, you know, snap out. Maybe. Like Cher said, snap out of it. I mean, Wesley, as as you said, the odds of having a hit TV show are so rare. But then having a hit show that somehow cements itself into the fabric of pop pop culture to live on forever. Land of the Lost is going to live on forever. That is so incredibly rare. That I would just think if you were able to be part of creating that and then had the opportunity to meet fans like us who were touched, grew up by that, was great memories. I mean, we always joke on this show. There's nothing wrong with going back and remembering what it was like to be 12 years old again. Right. You know, those were great times, great memories. Wouldn't wouldn't an actor or an actress want to put those issues aside to to say thank you to the audience that's coming to greet you and go wesley you have no idea how important you were every saturday morning i grew up watching you and rooting for you and scared for you and you know it's 50 years later that should be the only reason you need as an actor to go out and make these appearances. I agree. We've, we, listen, we, we have some of the most extraordinary times with people that we get to meet. One, one guy came up to us and he was obviously in his fifties and he's, he's sobbing. He said, look, I, I apologize. He said, I got to tell you something. My friend, my dad was leaving us. He was divorcing my mom and I was a kid and I didn't think I could handle it. He said, so between the second, the second season of Land of the Lost and the third when we lost our dad. He said, I saw you lost your dad and your uncle came in and your family survived. He said, it gave me the strength to know that my family could survive. He says, I know it may sound hokey to you, but it meant the world to me. We had, we had two guys, or one guy come up to us and said, listen, I thought you spoke Farsi. I go, we go, what? He said, yeah, we, my brother and I, we used to live in, a, I think it was a, a Persia. It was Iraq. I forgot what the what it was back before the war. <laughs> and he said, but we immigrated. We we left during the war after the war. 
And we both became scientists because of Land of the Lost. And he, and he said, we are now wow. two heads. We are two heads of the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, JPL. He said, would you like to come and have a private tour? And we go, are you crazy? Of course. So we went to JPL because of Land of the Lost. And not only we go through every security door and everything, but we finally went to the last room. And imagine this, it's secure as all heck. No one's allowed in this room. It's very high, high uh, security. We go in and there's a, it's an empty room of computer banks all along the wall, like 40 of them plus. And one guy with a joystick in the corner. And this guy was driving the Mars rover. Wow. Mars. He had a driver's license that was the, for he had driven every rover up to that date. And he had a Mars driver's license. And he goes, he goes, land of the lost. He goes, you want to, you want to drive the Mars rover? <laughs> go, yeah. <laughs> so we go sit, Kathy and I go sit down with our, with our host and, you know, and it's a joystick, like, you know, Game Boy. And, you know, we're playing with it. We're watching on the computer, what happens now. It did not move the mm -hmm. Mars rover. Because what he did was he would program it every day, erase, do what he needed to do. And then when he finished programming what the next day was going to be, he would send it to Mars, which takes about eight hours. But so as soon as we left, he erased everything. But, it, you know, the fact that those kind of doors open up. One young girl Amazing. One, one came up to us and again, she was crying. She said, listen, I lived in Compton and it was very dangerous. And my mom wouldn't let us go play out in, in the streets uh, during the weekends. We'd come home, watch Land of the Lost on Saturday morning and play Land of the Lost all weekend. Blankets would become caves, slee stack. I, she said, I'd be Holly, you know. And she said, you have no idea the joy that it gave us, you know, when we were, we were stuck in the house all weekend during my youth. And so all these stories, you know, that happen, and there are many of these stories. And we don't take it for granted at all. We we get we get the privilege because we've also been those kids sitting in front of a TV set with a bowl of cereal. I was that kid watching Lost in Space, wanting to be Billy Mummy, you know. Uh, so it's when when I was starting out, there was a Dennis the Menace cartoon on this in the Sunday paper, and I remember and I and I cut it out and had it framed for years in my house, and it was Dennis and his best friend Joey, and they were going to go meet. Cowboy Bob and Cowboy Bob was their big hero at, on TV. And they go up to Cowboy Bob and they ask for an autograph and Cowboy Bob gives them this autograph and it's really kind to them. And the last panel was Dennis saying to Joe, he says, I, one day I want to grow up and be like Cowboy Bob and make kids happy. And I, that resonated with me. I was, at, I was at the height of my career, you know, I was doing really well. And that just, I, that was the, that was the, I said, never forget that. And for years it followed every place I lived, it was framed. Well, so, you know, Wesley, you, you, you did. I mean, I can speak for myself. You made kids happy. You made me happy. I mean, I, I think as I look back at my childhood growing up through the seventies, I see Kiss and Land of the Lost and all the Sid and Marty Croft as my escape as a child that that's how you could escape yeah. from what was going on in the world and to some extent it was i wasn't big into comic books because i always knew comic books were not real that mm -hmm. super, superman wasn't real batman wasn't real spider-man wasn't real but like this was real you were real. I, yeah. I, you know, I could go meet you. I could see you. You as you from that show. I always knew it's like, oh, yeah, Spider, that Spider-Man that's going to be at the gas station next weekend. It's not really Spider-Man. That's just somebody in a costume. So as a kid growing up, that's kind of, you know, what these pop culture phenomenons meant to us. It was how we escaped. It was. It was real life superheroes to us. It was real life cartoon characters. To and us. we don't see the backside of it with you, like you do being there on the set with the production. We just see the finished product. So it's even more magical to kids 
And so that person telling you about the uncle coming in on the third season and how he was losing his father and that the family was okay, that I can totally understand exactly what that person was saying. Because especially back then, because that was way before the internet and we had what, three channels? That was it. So it's like you really look forward to these shows every week because it was, to Michael's point, are your way to escape from everything else that was going on in your life, even if you're just a you know a kid at the time. And that's why it made such an impression. I mean, we say a lot on our show, we're like, we don't ever want to lose that 12 year old inside of us. And we get, we take a modicum of shit for that. And I don't, you know, I, I think having that the childhood memories and still being able to connect with that part of your soul is essential for who you are as a person. I agree. You know, and it, it it is amazing, but I'm always surprised at who's a fan of Land of the Lost. Kathy and I were in Vegas doing the Star Trek, and we decided we were we were we were invited to go to the SLS Hotel, and they were doing a rock and roll show called Unlock the Vault. I don't know if you guys ever heard it. It was all rockers. It was and Tracy Gunn and all of these amazing rockers that were. It was a huge show, and it was the old International Hilton Hotel where Elvis had performed years ago, and so we go and we take a sleep stack. Kathy brings her sleep stack head and they ask us to come back before the show. All these, and I'm like nervous. And Kathy goes, What's wrong with you? I go, Kathy, I'm nervous. These are rock stars. All these guys were the, the lead drummers and guitarists for all the major bands. And, and I don't I don't know if they're and Guns N' Roses and all this stuff. And we go back and they all come and they want they do pictures and all that stuff. But Tracy Gunn from the original Guns N' Roses, he goes, Guys, guys, come here, come here. I go, what, what? He goes, listen, would you do a special photo with me, just me alone? He says, I love your show. My kids love your show. And I'm going, you're Tracy Guns, you know? Right. You're a rock star. And suddenly, you know, and suddenly to him, I'm a rock star. And right. it was this mutual admiration things where we're doing photos and I'm singing... I'm singing the theme song with Tracy Guns is singing the theme song with me. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, it's, but you're right. You never know how, who it's going to touch or how it's going to touch somebody's life. Because remember at those times we were watching Land of the Lost, we're, we're vulnerable kids. You right. know, when, when we've got that bowl of cereal, you know, we're, that's our, that was back in, of course, back in the day when, when Saturday meant something for kids, but it's the, it's the formula for years, formative years. And, and, it is amazing. It is amazing how it, it touches us and how it ha- touches and can help wire us as adults. Oh, well, yeah. It, and it, I, it, it, I was going to say real quick, it, it really is. It, it might take 40 or 50 years down the road, but then all of a sudden you're like, wow, I didn't realize that that TV show was the impetus of this part of me. It influenced me, maybe not on purpose, but being exposed to it and growing up all of a sudden you look back and go that's why mm-hmm. we that's have, why more people come up to say they become scientists archaeologists uh because of land of the lost i mean and and major people major you know we we did we did the uh um um oh gosh uh what was the show uh a- ancient aliens uh they did, did a big mm-hmm. we were the first yeah. guests we did that with them the first year and all these scientists would come up to us. These were the guys that were investigating all the aliens and stuff. Go, We were kids. We watched land of the lost, the aliens and stuff. And this triggered a desire for us to, to want to investigate and be part of that community. Well, yeah. Because and they got in our raft it. and took the photo and screamed going over a waterfall. <laughs> so. Because you, because you unlocked the imagination of, of the children and, you know, I don't know Tracy personally, but I can tell you there are a lot of the musicians we have on the show are dorks just like us. And <laughs> just because they're in a position that they're in doesn't mean that they were any less affected by something that you created and did when they were kids. It's just what we all chose for our path in life is different than one another, but it's the same thing. You know, listen, I'm Dragon Tales is the show I co-created on PBS, which ran for nine years, an animated show. And I found out that, that Jennifer Lopez named her two kids after the two main characters, Max and Emmy. There you and go. It's like, what? <laughs> you know? 
you never know the ripple effect of whatever we do. And I'm not talking about just actors and, and performers and stuff, but, you know, I mean, you know, working at a grocery store, kindnesses, small kindnesses yep. at a grocery store that ripple through, you know, an accountant that, that helps change somebody's life, that the ripple effect, all the things we do in life have ripple effects. Yep. So. Yep. Wesley, this has been absolutely fascinating. It's been an, an incredible time time travel journey back to Saturday mornings with Captain Crunch and laying in front of the TV set while your parents slept away for a few more hours. Get away from me, kid. You bother me. Go watch your cartoons. Um, what what where where are some of your upcoming appearances? So any of our listeners who want to want to get in the raft with you and Kathy, where can they meet you? Well, if you go, the best way is go on Facebook. Land of the Lost, 1974, 76, if you join that one, or or my Facebook, Wesley Ewart. There's two, I have two Facebook. But like we're heading next, into, next week, we're going to Wyoming. We're going to Green Bay, Wisconsin, Philadelphia, Mesa, Arizona. Uh, we're going, I mean, we're, we're traveling so much and doing a lot of shows, especially as we're coming upon our 50th anniversary next year. So it's starting, I think it's sort of a snowball. I think we'll probably go to Pensacon, Florida again for Pensacon, you know, Pensacon. Uh, we're hoping, you know, we're hoping to do a, a, other big shows. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, you can, you can all, listen, I'm all over social media. You can always oh, you, 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 you are. Yeah, I mean, you can find Wesley everywhere. You're very, listen, I, I you're may very be active old. and responsive. I may be old, but I've learned how to, how to play with social media. So, uh, oh yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, you are, you are busy traveling the convention circuit. And, and, and speaking of what you just said, Kathy, no, you know, Kathy's the one that said, let's do the yellow raft. So now we created something else in the last week and it's already been booked for Mesa, Arizona. We're doing a Saturday morning pajama party at the conventions where you come, we give you bowls of cereal and breakfast. <laughs> we sit on the floor or if, if, you, if you are a chair, most of our group, right. you'll sit on the chair. Yeah, yeah. We're going to do, we're gonna do a pajama contest. We're doing sing-alongs from the old TV theme th songs from the Saturday mornings. We're doing a Q and A's. We're we're doing prizes and and giveaways and watching episodes of Land of the Lost, and we're gonna. I love it. We create a Saturday morning, and so it'll be before the convention starts. So we're starting to see if, if that's going to be something we can we can create and make work for us, and creating another experience for all of us. I don't care which shows you watched on Saturday morning, you know, whether it was Shazam or whatever it was, a Johnny Quest, you know. Yep. We're trying to create a moment in time for our generation that goes back to when we were open and vulnerable. Yeah. It, to a moment where we, we just smiled because things made us happy again. Like we've said, never forget that moment when you were 12 years old and you got goose pimples because you were watching something. And now every time you see that again, you are taken back to that moment and you remember what it was like to see it the first time to hear that song the first time that's that's pretty special i kathy when we do these shows i see guys in their 50s and 60s come up and dissolve into seven-year-old boys in front of kathy with their crush their first crush you know of holly and stuff and they just they become you can see it it just it just dissolves away and they are kids again you, the sparkles back and they're like oh my god that's Holly, I had the biggest crush. She was the first girl I had a crush on. And you see it happen all the time. And it's it's that you're exactly right. It's all of that, all, all of our lives just sort of fade away and we go back to that safe spot. Wesley, again, thank you so much. What a what a trip down memory lane. Um, I can personally recommend anybody go out and meet Wesley and, and Kathy at any of their appearances that are near you. You won't be disappointed. It's not just a walk up, shake hands and walk away type of experience. You really go above and beyond. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. I really thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you. Tommy's got to jump really quick. So you can say your goodbyes, Tommy. Then Mark and Hi, I everybody. will wrap this up. Um, Mark, was that a trip down memory lane? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot. The reason I enjoyed it, just because so many of the people that are that are KISS fans, a good chunk, not not everyone, but a good chunk is in our age bracket. 
they're going to have the same warm and fuzzies over land of the lost that you and I do. And Tom is with Tommy still here, but you know, the three of us did I, it, look, it was just a part of uh, everything that, that we talked about was, was so spot on, especially if you're in our age group, bowl of cereal, land of the lost Saturday morning, you're good to go. And you know, what's funny. He did mention something that in retrospect uh, is, is so true. I didn't realize again, you know, cause you're a kid, but yeah, you're right. When you think about it, those were some pretty, you know, adult sort of, and I don't very mean serious stories. Way. Yes. You know? Um, yeah. I mean, they didn't play it down at all at all, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just a fun, fun and what a great guy, man. I, I love his energy and he's, it's so contagious. So oh, yeah, he, he, loves, lo- he loves what he's doing. He loves the character he played. He's not embarrassed by it. He's not trying to shy away from it. He embraces it. And, and again, I've, I've seen him at a couple conventions. What he and Kathy do is, is so worth what it would cost to get that photo. Because many times, we won't name names, but you'll go to these conventions and you walk up to that table and the guy's just sitting behind that table, pulls an eight by 10 out, 40 bucks, signs it, takes a selfie and says, thank you. Wesley and Kathy put on truly an incredible experience where you're going to be like, look at this photo. I'm in the wrap with with Will and Holly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really that that is what it's all about, especially at this age, you know, Um Sorry, just, I, again, I've been I got work stuff coming in, um, but yeah, uh, just that's what it's about when you go to those meet and greet things. Um, and again, that's where it kind of ties into Kiss a little bit. You know, you, you want to have that great experience. You want to have that memory. You know, um, so I mean, if you're a fan and 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 you wanted to have that sort of experience make sure you go to where, you know, Wesley's going to be. I mean, yeah. that, uh, that sounds like a whole lot of fun to me. So. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, I what, yeah, we, we, we didn't, we didn't do much kiss talk, but who cares? This was just a fun seventies flashback episode. I, you know, homework. Did you watch land of the lost? Did you watch Sid and Marty Croft? I mean, Tell us, what was it like for you as a kid growing up with these TV shows? Because they were different. Those were different shows back then. They were not <laughs> I cartoons. Tell you, I tell you what, today was was really a great example of what we say. We do this for us. <laughs> yeah, we do this because we want to have a good time. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, when Mike sent the, the email out a few weeks ago, I was like, you want to have the guy from Land of I'm like, fuck yeah, are you kidding me? Like, what does that have to do with Kiss? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? They're both out of the seventies. There's your yeah. connection, people. Yeah. So they, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, you guys had fun this week. And and again, you know, that's what this is all about. It's, you know, again, a couple guys here, three guys, four guys, whatever, sitting at a bar talking, and all of a sudden, somebody comes in wearing a sleeve stack shirt, and you stop talking about kids, you and you go, did you, about- did you ever watch that when you were a kid? And then for the next three hours, it's all about memories and stories. Yeah, so that's what today was a, a nice little diversion, and you know, hey, it was a lot of. I enjoyed it, and again, I loved it. I, I loved I didn't it. Chime in a ton, and I, I, you look, people go, oh, Mark, look, because you're right. I do talk a lot at, at times, but when I'm really quiet, it's because I'm you're digging, paying attention. Yeah, I'm digging what I'm hearing. You know, I again, this wasn't him coming on. Wasn't like you know, all of us here, are, you know, such storied and you know, well-versed in our KISS talk, I, you know, I didn't know all the stuff. I wanted to learn. So yeah. if, 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 if something Saturday morning cartoon thing comes up again or whatever, you can, you know, in a conversation, you go, hey, we had the guy from Land of the Lost on, and he said this, you know. He said and, Star Trek was all involved with the creation of the yes, show. It's like, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, that, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So I had a lot of fun today. I hope you guys had a lot of fun today, too. And before we go, uh, just a big shout out to uh, Julian Gill, 
He'll know what I'm talking about. And it was non kiss. Um, did a did a did a big favor for me today. Just wanted to say thank you. So, and it had nothing to do with kiss. So, <laughs> um, all right, everybody, that's it. Three sides of the coin. We're out of here. We'll see everybody next week. We are taking July fourth no, no. off. We're yeah. off. We're not recording so, on the fourth of July. Yeah, so so there'll be fourth, one week. So on the fourth, this will drop. Yep. And then the following Tuesday, wah, 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 wah. we'll dig up an old episode to repost. You know what? We do got Tommy's second half of the Ace Frilly thing. Oh, yeah. Ooh. I got to get on his case to dig that up and get it to me. Maybe, right, maybe we'll uh, have a filler. All right. That's it. Let's wrap this up. We'll see everybody next episode. Do you have something to say? Leave a voicemail or send us a text message. Call 320-515-VOICES for three sides of the coin. Provided by LarryDavisVoice.com and by jessicamarsvoice.com. That's Mars with a Z.